established finance ones, I could see that being something that could continue. You know, if there's like a paper you want to see and it happens to be being presented there, that would be so convenient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would guess it's the more I would guess it's actually the more specialized ones that are going to survive the longest because you know there's some people mm -hmm. at LSE who or NYU or in Philly who are whose research I really want to keep up with, and I might not get them at conferences that much. So those those are the kinds of um, series that I think I'd be most interested in uh, attending virtually later. Yeah, I think um, we have for household finance this uh, juniors only seminar, and it's a really good environment for early stage go. work. And you get all this feedback from people all over in your field. And that yeah. kind of specificity is also really nice. So I think something like that could have some staying power. Yeah. Well, since we still have a minute, um, is it okay with the organizers if I briefly um, give a plug to the competition, the seminar series? that I'm, I'm co-hosting. What do we think about that, Arash? <laughs> I'm fine. Competition is good. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's fine. Don't worry. I'd like to tell everybody who's here that there is a search and matching in macro and finance virtual seminar series. The website is sammf.com. And the next seminar will be Terry Hendershot from UC Berkeley. And then there'll be a workshop on the housing market on March 26th. It'll be awesome to see some of you guys there. Well, you know, John, you will advertise VMAX, I guess, right? The next time. <laughs> it on VMAX. Yeah, um, I think that'd be fair. No problem. If you if you want to come on and advertise VMAX, that'd be fair. No, all good. So, I see Stefania is here as well. Yes, kind of hiding. You're hiding. <laughs> yeah, because I just came back from running, so <laughs> it was boring. So I basically I look like a a, a wet uh, cat or dog. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> hi everyone, <laughs> Pittsburgh weather. So um, anyway, yeah, but uh, at least it wasn't teaching. So, Mon, will you post the ground rules or should I post them? I think I'm posting them now. Okay. Well, that's pretty long. You could have kept it short. So it's basically just Q&A during the talks and then live questions afterwards, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, got it. So Mon, you, you will do the introduction, I guess. You're the moderator today, right? Yep. Okay, then I just take care of the technical stuff and then let's wait another minute yeah. Okay, I guess it's uh, time to start. So welcome everybody to uh, the spring summer session of uh, VMAX. And we have a slightly new format. Uh, we have two talks per session, so a 10 minute talk and a 40 minute talk. And after the 40 minute talk, we have uh, time for live questions. Um, and I'll also, um, after, I'll, during the talk, I'll post a link to a post session discussion uh, forum uh, where you, everybody is welcome to show up. Um, so just a reminder of the ground rules, uh, everybody's muted and uh, we won't unmute you unless we have permission. Uh, if you have questions, please uh, use the Q&A rather than uh, the chat. Um, so that, that works well because then uh, we can also send the questions to the talkers afterwards. 
Um, apart from that, um, let me uh, kick this off by handing over to our first speaker, which is 10 minute talk by Lucas Ehrenberg uh, on why a pandemic recession boosts the asset prices. Thank you so much, Martin. Thank you everybody for um, organizing this and um, what an honor to be leading off this session. Um, well, you all know that um, the stock market is in some sort of a boom. It came as a huge surprise when asset prices turned around in the uh, pretty early on in the pandemic. So uh, people have pointed this out elsewhere, but in the, the global financial crisis had an, basically an asset price drop uh, that lasted for a year before it turned into recovery and then the recovery was quite slow. And here we had a brief but very steep drop followed by in a way an incredible recovery that I don't think anybody was anticipating back then. So um, here's the other empirical graph I have to show here is motivating this. So there's something different about this recession, something very different. So um, I'm plotting the great recession here in the left. I think that's representative of the standard recession, um, textbook consumption smoothing, output falls by a certain amount, consumption falls by half as much. And here we have a completely different pattern. Here we have consumption falling more than output. This is the first recession that I'm aware of where this is happening. I mean, there are other recessions that people think of as consumption led, but here consumption is ground zero of the recession. Output fell by just a little bit less than percentage points. So that's, that's striking. So let's try to make sense of these facts. Um, there was a steep and brief crash followed by an unprecedented recovery. It was quite broad based and that also came as a surprise to people. Big stocks came first, this was the figure, but uh, the S&P 500, but small stocks followed. Bonds were, bonds rally too. They peaked in already in July and since then they've been down, but you know, in terms of a quick recovery, bonds were also affected and housing markets, if anything, are still accelerating. It's incredible. So, and again, this came as a huge surprise at the time, although we have by now, I mean, maybe I'll read the, the articles in various news outlets discussing what could be going on. So candidate explanations, this, this is what I've seen in the media. I have in my paper quoted a few uh, Reuters, CB, uh, CBS, um, Wall Street Journal news sources, so you can have a look there. But this is what people were proposing at the time, i.e. last summer when I first wrote the paper. So one explanation is, well, maybe investors simply expected the pandemic would be over quickly, maybe fueled by some political dis um, discussions. Uh, a second candidate argument is that, well, um, the pandemic is, if, is, is hurting restaurants, but restaurants aren't on the stock market, whereas versus Netflix is on the stock market, and obviously the pandemic was great for Netflix. A uh, third argument is central, it was all the fault of the Fed, or you know the, the credit of the Fed, depending on how you want to look at it, or possibly um, to the credit of the federal government, federal governments in various countries. Um, if on anything in other countries, governments have been even more generous with the income support than in the United States. So um, let's go through those. So I don't think the, I think the first one, it can't be it. That's just clear. Like at least from May, 2020 on, there was some sort of global consensus that the pandemic would last in some form until a vaccine was made broadly available. And we were hoping that that would happen in 2021. So if anything, this is the one macroeconomic shock where I'm willing to say everybody had rational expectations of how at least the economics of it would play out from um, you know, May 2020 or maybe summer 2020 on. Um, you know, obviously, um, stocks of companies that were arguably profiting from the pandemic did rise the most, but the boom was very broad based. The central bank intervention was brief. The government intervention took longer, but you know, if anything, standard loanable funds theory from the uh, undergrad textbooks would predict that if the government borrows and gives the money to people and then they save it, uh, while well, they would predict actually low high interest rates and low asset prices. So while that might be part of it, I think that doesn't quite mesh with what we've been seeing. So in this paper, I'm going to say, yes, indeed, it has something to do with saving. It has a lot to do with saving, but it doesn't have to do with an availability of more money to save. It has to do with a desire to save more. So this is the story here is that due to health risks, social sectors of the economy are curtailed or even shut down. So, um, you know, that's, that means that there will be less uh, demand for consumption goods. It could also mean that production is curtailed. So obviously that in some, maybe it's not that consumers are worried about eating at restaurants, but maybe it is that uh, servers are refusing to work at restaurants or at least until they're outfitted with protective equipment. 
So it could be through the consumption side or it could be through the production side, but there's reasons to think that consumption is the tighter constraint. Um, servers by and large did return to restaurants when they were asked to because they needed the money and anyway, they started wearing masks pretty soon. And anything consumption again was the, was the bigger drop also suggesting that consumption was the one leading this and not the curtailment of production possibilities so much at least. So the story here is that a lower value of consumption causes a lower marginal value of producing output. Uh, I'll have the math in a moment. And a temporarily low value of output means that you would, um, well, you have money right now that you don't need right now, quote unquote, so you'd like to save it. And here is the real, here's the reason why you would want to do this in a model instead of just uh, figuring it out verbally. So far, I think the, the in intuition is all pretty strong. But the reason you want to model is because the model really clarifies that it's not about savings. It's not about people being able to save more in the model, uh, at least in the simplest version of my model. Um, the desire to save can't be satisfied in the aggregate because guess what? It's income equals consumption in the model. And yet asset prices are seeing the big boom because it's about the desire to save, not necessarily whether you have an ability to save more. And if anything, if the government makes saving easier by giving you lots of money that would go in the opposite direction that would mitigate the asset price boom and not um, cause it. All right, here's a model. Uh, it's a nearly standard neoclassical growth model for details. I'm afraid I'll have to uh, refer you to the paper because I'm already halfway or more through to my talk. So for simplicity, so this is a nearly standard neoclassical growth model if you've been teaching um, graduate or senior undergraduate macro at any point in the last few years, you will remember this very well. And maybe my students are in the audience, I don't know, but if you are, you will recognize this too. For simplicity, I'll fix the capital stock at once. So that's the difference. I started with the regular Lucas tree model. Guess what? Standard Lucas tree model in this framework here actually predicts that asset prices will be infinite, positive infinity. That seemed like too much. So instead, I fixed the capital stock at one. So um, and but I let but I have I have labor. I have an elastic margin. So unlike in the Lucas tree model where production is an endowment economy, here we have some production that can be elastically adjusted. So there's going to be an Euler equation. Um, there is going to be a marginal value of income, the Lagrange multiplier on the on the budget constraint. There's going to be an asset price and the right-hand side is pretty standard. You have um, dividends in the period here, the return on capital. So the capital price today depends on the marginal value of income, that's the desire to save, and expectations of future dividends and prices. I am defining a normal state to be basically a steady state where there's never a pandemic. And in the normal state, uh, the marginal value of consumption is one over consumption, pretty standard with log utility, so that's demand determined. In a pandemic state, however, I'm assuming that consumption is capped at C hat. So C hat is an amount that if you consume more, you die, or you maybe you risk your grandmother's death and hopefully you care about her. So um, we can't consume beyond a certain amount. So that means that the marginal value of the budget constraint is actually gonna be supply determined. It's not determined by how much you want to spend the extra dollar, but do I really wanna work hard to get the extra dollar given that I can't use it on what I really want to use it? So uh, here's the main result. So if the pandemic is forever, I'm going to get an asset price Q hat, which is just a scaled down version of the regular asset price. So if the pandemic is forever, dividends are lower forever. Therefore, it makes sense that asset prices are lower forever and everything is scaled down. But a one period pandemic is very different because a one period pandemic, the right hand side is exactly what it would be in steady state. So the only thing that's different is on the left hand side and if lambda changes then q must change in proportion because again the right hand side if you expect the future to be back to normal is equal to whatever the left hand side would be in the normal times so now we can do some uh, forward iteration and um sorry i never know if it's forward or backward anyway you can iterate this and uh, a pandemic that lasts for n periods so it could be zero which means it's to active today but over tomorrow or it could be going on longer and you get the price so basically stock prices divided by the long run level would be a weighted average between the lost dividends and the value of saving and as you can all see well beta is going to be something like 95 percent over a year or more so as long as n is not on the order of decades 
this demand desire to save term is simply going to dominate. So I got a picture here. There is going to be a downward sloping. This is not a not a not a monetary model with prices or anything. This is the marginal value of income and the level of income. There's going to be a supply side that slopes up, a demand side that slopes down, a long-term asset pricing curve and a short-term asset pricing curve. And what the pandemic does is it curtails the demand side and not the supply side. And as a result, the de desire to uh, save and the value of income. The, the value of income goes down, that's like saying the desire to save goes up and short-term asset pricing means that asset prices have to rise because again, you can't really use the money today for what you really want. This is robust to various extensions that I'm describing in the paper. Again, please have a look or email me or ask me in the Q&A. Um, elastic capital supply. So suppose you can actually increase the supply of savings. Um, the results are weaker, but it still works. Um, if the pandemic affects sectors differently, it also hurts the supply side. The story goes through unless it hurts the supply side a lot more than the demand side. And here's, the, here's a, a result that I thought was very important. Did investors in May 2020 or in July 2020 understand this model? Of course not. It came as a huge surprise to everyone. I can't claim that people understood this very model in last summer. Maybe now, but certainly not last summer. So what's going on? So here's a story, story basically where the pandemic hits. Everybody understands the pandemic and it will be and it will be over in two years. But what they don't understand is what the pandemic will do to asset prices. They think the pandemic will cause a loss of income. That's correct. Therefore, asset prices go down, but they don't realize that everybody is saving. Therefore, as everybody is personally responding to their own private incentives, um, asset prices, the boom. So the point here is that agents don't understand the effect of consumption restrictions, but they act optimally. And they are rational, perfectly rational in the sense that they understand when the pandemic starts and they understand when the pandemic is over. All they don't know is um, they only don't, they only basically use um, the, the standard model where every recession causes an asset price um, crash. So all they don't know here is that there's going to be a boom. Everything else, they're acting optimally, and then you get the zigzag pattern that, well, maybe we're here. It looks very suggestive. I wouldn't say tomorrow we're going to be here because that would be an incredible prediction. But I think at least it, it's at least reason to think that the current asset price boom will perhaps counterintuitively not last long beyond the quote unquote end to the pandemic, whenever that might be. So here's the summary. You guys can uh, read that faster than I can um, read it out. I Wait. guess the that everybody's asking is what about money and as a monetary economist myself i'm a little bit ashamed to say that i actually wrote a purely real model here but again uh that's something i'd love to chat with you guys later thanks a lot uh, lucas uh, almost precise on 10 minutes i think you went two minutes over but uh thanks a lot that was great yeah and as i said uh if you have uh, questions for for lucas you can post in q a and you can also talk to him and yeah after in the post session uh, forum that we will come up at the uh, uh, at the end of um, of today yeah and i'll post the link in the chat great thanks a lot um let's hand over to sasha all right thank you so much for the opportunity to present this paper as part of this series um this paper investigates how the financial health of lenders affects the credit channel of monetary policy. And in particular, I focus on the pass through of monetary policy to households and consumers. So um, part of the motivation for this question is that uh, a common feature of financial crises is that lenders typically uh, often will experience large asset losses. And uh, this graph here is showing uh, cumulated, uh, cumulative uh, crisis related losses. Uh, associated with the global financial crisis across the world. And these were on the order of trillions of dollars. Now, in most of our theories of monetary policy, the financial sector is a key juncture through which monetary policy reaches the real economy. However, we know uh, relatively little empirically about how the financial health of lender and how things like asset losses affect uh, the credit channel of monetary policy. Sorry, Sasha, you're, 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 we see a black screen. Oh no, okay, I'll try and reshare. So that happens sometimes. All right, I'll try and get that shared again. Can you see the slides? Um, it's waiting to come up. Um, yes. Nothing yet? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm seeing a message that Zoom 
went. Okay. Uh, okay, you can see the slides now. Yeah, we see the slides. Yeah. Okay. And let's see. Did it just change? Yes, that's right. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, hard to avoid these technical errors. So, hmm. uh, the, uh, just to catch us back up to where we just were, a common feature of financial crises are large losses borne by lenders. Now, empirically, we don't know very much about how these asset losses affect the credit channel of monetary policy, and the goal of this paper is to shed new light on this question. Uh, specifically, what I want to do is investigate uh, uh, the causal effect of asset losses on the sensitivity of lending to conventional monetary policy. So basically, I want to know, does uh, the credit channel of monetary policy become stronger when lenders are in worth financial shape, or does it become weaker? Now, um, talking to people, um, and a lot of macroeconomists seem to have strong priors about this, but they're very dispersed priors. And the reason for this is uh, there are ultimately a couple really simple uh, frameworks we can use that will give rise to completely opposite predictions. So, um, for example, uh, on one hand, asset losses might uh, weaken the credit channel of monetary policy if they cause constraints on lending to bind more tightly. So this could be like a regulatory constraint, leverage ratios, basically a bank is in bad financial health and uh, they're not as able to respond to monetary easing, even though they would love to. Now, on the other hand, we could also have that asset losses enhance the credit channel of monetary policy. Why is that? Well, it can be that there are financial frictions that are constraining lending that are alleviated when we lower the policy rate. So another way to think of that is that the sickest patient benefits the most from the medicine. So empirically, I want to see which of these two types of scenarios actually played out during the global financial crisis. And I'll be looking at the US setting in particular. Now, why is this an interesting and important macroeconomic question? Well, it can tell us three very interesting things. So first, it tells us something fundamental about the mechanics of monetary transmission, and in particular, about the nature of the state dependence of monetary policy. Additionally, this um, because there are uh, different models that give rise to different predictions, we can learn something about the type of financial frictions that were uh, dominant during the global financial crisis. And finally, this is also a useful question for policy and thinking about the conduct of monetary policy. And in particular, it's informative about the complementarity or substitutability of conventional monetary policy and unconventional tools like large scale asset purchases, which affect, uh, which can offset asset losses borne by lenders. Now, uh, how am I gonna do this? So this is different from a lot of uh, typical macro papers. This is gonna be primarily uh, empirical work and I'm gonna focus on the empirics uh, in today's shorter session. And what I'm gonna do is estimate the causal effects and interaction of asset losses and the two-year treasury rate on lending. And the setting in which I'm gonna do this estimation is using uh, data on the universe of credit unions in the US. For now, just think of credit unions as small banks, but I'll talk about some of their relevant uh, features and how they differ from banks in a couple slides. Now, empirically, how am I gonna get these causal effects? Now, uh, one reason I'm focusing on credit unions is that they held a unique asset that had plausibly exogenous variation during the crisis. So that's gonna be helpful for getting at the causal effect of asset losses. Now for monetary policy, I'm gonna do something a bit more off the shelf. I'm gonna use high frequency identification of monetary policy shocks. And uh, just to summarize the main results, um, I find three things. So first, I estimate that asset losses increase the sensitivity of lending to monetary policy. So this is consistent with that second scenario I described where monetary easing alleviates financial frictions and those lenders that are hurting the most are the ones that also benefit the most from monetary easing. Additionally, I dig into different aspects of consumer lending and I find that monetary easing, conventional easing, leads to substitution towards mortgages and away from other consumer credit products. So this suggests that mortgages are a bit special in terms of how they react to monetary policy. And additionally, within a credit category, so for example, within mortgages, lending responds along the extensive margin. That is, people are not getting bigger mortgages, rather they're more likely to get a mortgage in the first place. Now this paper, it contributes to several different areas of literature. So in recent years, there's been um, an exciting literature that documents all sorts of 
uh, types of state dependence in the transmission of monetary policy. And what's novel in this particular paper is the focus on lender financial health as a source of state dependence. Additionally, I, uh, with the data I have, I can look separately at mortgages and non-mortgage credit, and I observe interesting differences in their sensitivity to monetary policy. There's also a big macro literature on the role of financial frictions in monetary transmission. And uh, part of what this paper is contributing is new empirical evidence on the nature of frictions affecting uh, creditors' responses to monetary policy. So uh, I hope where part of this paper can be useful is that it provides some new empirical facts. It can help us better discipline our models. Ideally, a model of the financial crisis should be consistent with the empirical evidence that I'm presenting here. So this is potentially a test that one could use in their model to assess if it's realistic. Um, and then finally, there's also a uh, more applied financial type of literature that looks at the macroeconomic consequences of credit supply shocks. And this paper contributes new empirical evidence on how monetary policy can be used to combat credit supply shocks. All right, so uh, I'm now gonna go over, uh, mainly what I wanna do now is build up intuition for theoretically why this effect is ambiguous. So this part is a little bit shortened. Uh, you can find a longer exposition in the paper. So I just wanna, uh, 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 again, build up intuition here. So the idea is that we can uh, write down simple models that generate opposing predictions for the effects of asset losses on uh, the credit channel of monetary policy. And in the paper, I show two such simple models. The first features a bank uh, with a capacity constraint. So this could be something like a leverage constraint. And what happens is when we lower the policy rate, that's not gonna have as big of an effect on lending when a bad balance sheet constrains lending. So in this first model, asset losses weaken the lending response to policy rate changes. Basically they cause constraints to bind and make it harder for the banks that are hurting to respond. Now on the other hand, a model that delivers the opposite prediction is the following. So in the second model, uh, the lender faces an external finance premium. Now, in reality, this is probably not the depositors disciplining the lender, but probably the, the wholesale uh, finance margin that lenders face. Now, uh, the risk premium that they're going to be charged when they're a risky lender for their wholesale finance, that's going to magnify the pass-through of changes to the risk-free rate to their effective cost of capital. So when we have monetary easing, that's gonna reduce this risk premium and there's gonna be an extra benefit in terms of the reduction in the cost of capital for these lenders that have a bad balance sheet. So in the second model, asset losses amplify the lending response to policy rate changes. So just wanted to build some intuition for why this could go in different directions. And as a reminder, I end up empirically finding evidence consistent with the second model that easing is alleviating frictions rather than exacerbating them. All right, so now um, the rest is gonna focus on uh, the empirics in the paper. So I'm gonna talk a bit about credit unions, the data I use, and then also the empirical strategy and identification. So what is a credit union? Now, for the most part, they resemble small banks. Um, one important feature of credit unions is that the members, so the people that um, get financial services from a credit union, uh, you have to be a member of this institution. And in order to do so, typically you need to have some type of common affiliation. Often this is formed around uh, a field of work. So there are teachers credit unions, there's a Chicago firefighters credit union, there's an IMF credit union. There's also ones that are formed around religion or a geographic area. Uh, so basically the people that are going to a credit union are gonna have some type of shared affiliation. Now, credit unions, they specialize in consumer credit. They're not doing commercial lending. They do a little bit of small business lending, but that's a really small part of what they do. So we wanna think of them really as small banks focused on lending to households. Now, in terms of their overall scale, uh, credit unions are uh, on, uh, they represent a non-trivial portion of total consumer credit. In terms of credit card lending, they account for about 4%. For mortgage lending, they're about 13% of the mortgage market. And historically, they've been much more dominant in the auto loans market, uh, historically accounting for around a quarter to a little bit more of all auto lending. Now, in terms of how they're regulated, they are not regulated by the FDIC. They're regulated by a similar institution uh, known as the NCUA, the National Credit Union Administration. And the leverage and liquidity rules that they face, 
they're written in a similar style to the ones that banks face, but they're generally a bit more stringent. And the idea is that they're a bit smaller and they want to uh, be extra cautious with credit unions. Now, in this time period that I'm going to study in the crisis, credit unions were not securitizing their loans. They were not allowed to start doing this until 2017. So they were holding loans on their balance sheet. So that's another important difference with banks. And finally, uh, as I mentioned, credit unions are seen as potentially more vulnerable and the regulatory framework has sought to be more protective. And credit unions have generally been restricted from holding uh, risky non-loan assets. So this would mainly be things like private label, asset-backed securities, or ABS. Now, the data I'm going to use, uh, it comes from their main regulator. So credit unions also have a version of call reports. One cool thing that's different in the credit unions call reports from the bank call reports is they also report uh, interest rate information. So you can see the average interest rates on various mortgage products, uh, different types of auto loans, credit cards, and so on. And the sample I'm going to work with is going to be a quarterly panel uh, that spans 2004 to 2011. And it's starting at 2004 just because of data completeness issues prior to that year. And I stop at the end of 2011 because after 2012, there were regulatory changes at credit unions that, that were related to this uh, special asset that they hold, which I mentioned earlier. Now, ultimately I have about 200,000 observations and I'm gonna be focusing on loan originations. And I'm gonna look at total loan origination. So all types of consumer credit products. And I'll also uh, focus in on fixed rate 30 year mortgages as well. Now for monetary policy, I'm gonna use the two year treasury rate as my measure of the policy rate. And I'm also gonna use data on daily Fed funds futures contract prices in order to do this high frequency identification. Now, uh, what are the identification challenges in this setting? So why is it difficult to estimate the causal effect of asset losses and monetary policy? There are two distinct uh, challenges here. So the first is uh, what we could think of as more of a macro general equilibrium challenge. Uh, downturns uh, tend to trigger easing. So that's the policy response to a weak economy. Downturns um, also tend to coincide with asset losses and uh, contractions in lending. So basically there are omitted macro level variables that we should be worried about uh, driving co-movements in these different variables. Now. Another uh, different identification challenge. So even if we could throw in a time fixed effect and deal with all of those uh, macro confounding factors uh, at a local level, asset losses could also be related to both credit supply, credit demand. For example, if a lender is now seeing a bunch of defaults on their loans and households are financially distressed, that could also affect their demand for credit as well. So it could affect the balance sheet of the lender, also affect credit demand. And ultimately this, is a, uh, this challenge is trying to separate credit supply from credit demand. So we want variation in uh, uh, assets at the lender that is unrelated to local economic conditions and also global macroeconomic conditions. So how am I gonna solve this? I'm gonna use an instrumental variable strategy and I'm gonna need two, essentially two types of instruments. So I'm gonna need to deal with um, both asset losses and monetary policy. For asset losses, I'm going to exploit this unique asset that credit unions held, which um, in prior work has been dubbed investment capital. And this investment capital had plausibly exogenous variation during the crisis. Now for monetary policy, I'm gonna do high frequency identification and uh, how I implement this is gonna be most similar. If you're familiar with Arlene Wong's job market paper, it's gonna be most similar to, to her implementation. Now, since we're in a shorter format today, I'll just, um, for anyone unfamiliar with high frequency identification, the idea is that we're gonna look at Fed funds futures contract prices. So these contracts that depend on what the Fed funds rate is going to be. And we're gonna look at their changes in a narrow window around FOMC announcements. And the idea is that just up until prior uh, the announcement occurring, uh, asset prices have already incorporated information about the current state of the economy. So that, uh, that quick discrete change right around the announcement is picking up on a monetary surprise that's uh, happening as a result of the FOMC announcement. Now I'm gonna talk about this unique asset that credit unions held and what drove its variation. So investment capital, again, is the name of this asset. Here, uh, we have a balance sheet for a credit union. Now, uh, legally, these are called natural person credit unions, the ones that do the lending to households, uh, 
and they're going to have a mix of assets and some mix of liabilities. Now, as I mentioned, um, natural person credit unions are regulated a bit more stringently, and they're supposed to essentially invest in, for their non-loan assets, relatively safe securities, uh, government-issued securities, and so on, whereas things like private label ABS are not things that they're supposed to hold directly on their balance sheet. Now, credit unions uh, prior to the crisis ended up getting indirect exposure to ABS through this investment capital asset. So how did this work? So it worked uh, through this other entity called a corporate credit union, which I'll just abbreviate to, to corporate here. And this corporate, you can kind of think of them as like a hedge fund for credit unions that would also provide uh, very a few uh, financial services, things like payment processing as well. Now these corporates, there are fewer of them, they're bigger, and they were uh, allowed to invest in riskier securities. Now, what's the connection between the credit union and the corporate? So the credit union essentially owns equity in the corporate. So an asset that the credit union owns is this investment capital. And depending on the value of the balance sheet of the corporate, that's going to affect the value of the credit union's investment capital. Now, the corporate, they could go out and invest in very safe securities, and some uh, corporates uh, stuck with extremely safe securities throughout the crisis. Others uh, invested quite significantly in ABS, in particular, private label asset-backed securities that ended up uh, uh, being at uh, the center of uh, a major component of the crisis. And some of these credit unions had zero exposure to private label ABS. One had as much as about 40% of its balance sheet in private label ABS in 2006. So right before the collapse of this market. Uh, some of the corporates ended up going bust. Some of the corporates ended up uh, doing just fine. Now, what's gonna drive variation in investment capital? So one thing I was already alluding to is the size of their ABS exposure. So if you had the bad luck as a credit union of going out and picking a corporate that invested uh, a lot in uh, private label ABS, uh, then you were going to all else equal experience larger losses in terms of your investment capital. The corporate experiences a loss that's gonna be charged against the investment capital that's owned by the credit union. So that's how those losses are passed on. Now, what else drives variation? So uh, the capital structure of the corporate is also going to affect the pass-through. So all else equal, if there's less debt in their capital structure, so if the corporate has a lot of equity, there's more equity to absorb a given loss. So there's gonna be less pass-through to the credit unions. And then finally, a credit union's relative share of ownership is also going to affect the pass-through. So if you're a bigger owner compared to the other credit unions invested in the same corporate, you're going to experience bigger losses. So even within the same corporate, we're also going to have variation across credit unions in terms of the asset losses that they experience. Now, think we to make things more concrete uh, for identification, what, what do we need to assume here? So what we want is that investment capital losses are exogenous with respect to the determinants of uh, local, uh, local loan demand and local economic conditions. Now, some pieces of relevant institutional background that I think help make these, this assumption plausible are the following. So this choice of corporate is something that is highly persistent and mainly driven by geography. Basically in the 90s, uh, these corporates became uh, a bigger part of the credit union system. A lot of credit unions invested in them at this time. And, addition, and they've stuck with the same corporate that they chose many years ago. Now, uh, another important, actually one of the uh, probably more important features is that investment capital is very sticky. It has a minimum duration requirement of up to 20 years. So basically the idea is that some credit unions chose a corporate that happened to be nearby many years ago. And when the crisis happened, they were not able to adjust that position and react to it. So they were essentially locked in and were gonna have to, ex to experience the losses as, uh, as they arrived. Now, intuitively, the variation in this instrument, it's similar to that of a shift share or Bartik style instrument. Uh, the idea being that there's this aggregate phenomena, the collapse of the ABS market, but there's also predetermined idiosyncratic exposure to the shock. So this graph here, just to get a sense of what was going on in the time series, in the solid line here, I'm plotting total investment capital in the credit union system. And in the dashed line, I'm plotting total natural person credit union lending. 
And what we see is around this time that investment capital uh, essentially fell off of a cliff. We saw a big slowdown in lending by credit unions. And just anecdotally from policymakers and regulators, it's generally perceived that this was the main juncture through which the financial crisis reached credit unions and one of the biggest sources of distress uh, for credit unions. All right, so now I'm gonna uh, go to the uh, econometric specification that I estimate and go over the main empirical results. So the goal is to estimate the following. So here I have a measure that uh, on the outcome I'm interested in is loan originations. And I'm gonna have three covariates I'm interested in where the third is an interaction term. So this first one here is the policy rate, the change in the policy rate in particular. And we should expect a negative coefficient. We expect the causal effect of a reduction in interest rates to be that it boosts lending. Now, if we get a positive interaction term here, what that's going to mean is that when we have an asset loss, so we have a negative term here, the magnitude of the coefficient on the policy rate is going to be larger. So it's a larger negative effect of policy rate hikes. This uh, second term here is change in uh, 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 the credit union's assets. So we expect that the causal effect of an asset loss is going to be negative and reduce, or rather, the, the, yes, the causal effect of an asset loss will be negative and reduce lending. So we expect a positive coefficient here because more assets should uh, lead to more lending. And again, if we have uh, this positive interaction term, what it means is that when we have a uh, policy rate decrease, this term is now going to be negative, and that's going to dampen the causal effect of changes in assets. So another interesting implication, the other side of the coin here, is that easing uh, reduces the contractionary effects of asset losses. Now, formally, how do I implement this? I'm going to use two-stage these squares. Something that's a little bit uh, different in this setting is I'm going to have three endogenous regressors, and I'm also going to end up having five instruments. My endogenous regressors are the policy rate change, asset losses, the interaction, and now to instrument for them, I'm going to have a couple uh, extra instruments. So I'm going to first have these monetary policy surprises. I'm going to have the change in the value of investment capital. Now, uh, the percent change in investment capital, that could be, uh, you know, a 50% change could not mean very much if a credit union doesn't hold a lot of investment capital. So the extra instruments I add in here are interacting this with uh, the size of the balance sheet that is comprised by investment capital prior to the shock. So that allows me to get that scale to uh, better reflect the impact on total assets at the credit union. Then the very last term is just the interaction of uh, the uh, monetary policy surprises and these different terms. Now, uh, what are the exclusion restrictions that I need for identification? So what I need is that investment capital only affects lending through the credit union's assets and not some other channel. Additionally, I need that the monetary policy surprises only affect lending through changes in the treasury rate. Now, I want to point out two important fixed effects I'm including here. Now, remember the data is quarterly, but that does mean I can still include a year fixed effect and uh, have a chance to be able to estimate uh, the, uh, the causal effect of monetary policy, even though that's just varying at a quarterly frequency. Now, I'm also, uh, because there's a lot of seasonality in lending, I'm going to include a quarter fixed effect. So just think of that as picking up on seasonality. All right. Now, this table shows the main results for total lending. And across these first three specifications, I'm just adding more uh, credit union level controls, county level controls. And then just for comparison, I have the OLS coefficients plotted in the fourth uh, column. So looking at the third column, which is the preferred specification because it's the most rigorous here, what we get is uh, the expected sign for the causal effect of monetary policy. That is a, uh, a decrease in the policy rate is uh, going to lead to a positive effect on total lending. In particular, what the magnitude here means is that a 10 basis point reduction in the policy rate leads to a 0.95 percentage point uh, increase in lending. Now here, I don't get that uh, asset losses are statistically significant when there are no changes in the policy rate, but the interaction term is positive and statistically significant. So what that means is uh, there are two main implications. So when we have an asset loss, and that term is negative here, the uh, magnitude of the coefficient on the policy rate is going to be larger. So asset losses lead to a larger effect of monetary policy on credit union lending. Additionally, when we have a policy rate 
uh, decrease here, that's going to lower the uh, magnitude of the uh, relationship between, oops, between assets and lending. So it dampens the effect of asset losses. All right, so next, uh, we're going to look at mortgage lending in particular. And we again see similar signs. So monetary easing uh, leads to more lending and we get a positive interaction term. So again, we still have the implication that uh, monetary easing uh, dampens the effects of asset losses and asset losses also enhance the credit channel of monetary policy. Now, next, I wanna look at uh, different margins of uh, the lending response. So um, I'm gonna look at, uh, I'm gonna change the outcome variable instead of being the amount, uh, the total amount of loan originations to be either the number of loans being originated or uh, the average loan size. Now, looking at this, and this is um, for, for total lending, we see that asset losses here do matter and again, have the expected sign. So more assets means more lending, fewer assets means uh, less lending, and the interaction term remains positive here. But interestingly, it looks like monetary policy itself, uh, when there are no changes in assets at least, does not have an effect on the number of loans. Um, it looks like it does have an effect on loan size. So what's going on here? Looking at different types of credit individually are gonna help uh, explain what's going on. So now uh, I'm still looking at the number of loans and the average loan size, but I'm looking at it just for mortgages in particular. So I'm narrowing down within a particular segment of consumer lending. And uh, we again get the expected sign for monetary policy so that easing leads to more lending, asset losses have a contractionary effect on lending, and the contractionary effect of asset losses is dampened by easing. But interestingly, all of the action is coming from this uh, extensive margin. All of the response is coming from the number of loans. The point estimates for loan size are uh, 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 not statistically significant and also economically small in their magnitude. So the bottom line from this part of the analysis is that for mortgage lending, uh, the uh, response to monetary policy and asset losses is uh, along the extensive margin. And what I think is really interesting about this is that this uh, tells us that there's uh, a lumpiness to the uh, to creditors' response, at least for consumer lending, uh, in response to these types of shocks. Now, uh, how can we um, rationalize what we're seeing here? So mortgages look a bit different than total lending, and uh, that's because when we look at total lending, uh, we weren't accounting for the fact that uh, monetary easing appears to induce substitution uh, towards mortgages. So here um, in these last two columns, I have the mortgage share of lending. And what we get is that when there's monetary easing, we're gonna have a big increase uh, towards um, mortgage lending and away from other consumer credit products. So when it looks like the intensive margin mattered before, that was because there was a switch from say, credit cards and auto loans into mortgages. If we look within a credit product category though, uh, we see the response uh, primarily coming through this extensive margin and the number of loans. All right, um, now I won't have uh, time today to go over these in detail, but I wanna mention a couple of placebo tests and other robustness checks that I do. So um, one placebo, so the main concern is that there's something special about these credit unions that ended up having large asset losses. Now to evaluate this, I do two different placebo tests. The first um, uses these asset losses during the crisis. And, and uh, what I find is that they do not predict pre-crisis lending. So if you had a big asset loss later on, you were not lending in a way that was systematically different prior to the crisis. Additionally, I also have um, less coverage of my data, but I can extend it uh, a bit for uh, the bigger credit unions back into 2001 to the 2001 recession. And I look at uh, if there's any differential sensitivity uh, to monetary policy in that episode for the credit unions that ended up later on experiencing larger asset losses. And when I do this, I don't find that the ones that uh, had the large asset losses later on responded any differently to monetary policy in 2001. So this is reassuring that this isn't something special about those credit unions, but rather it's a, a bit of bad luck that they encountered during the crisis. I also uh, interact the policy rate with a bunch of other credit union characteristics and controls and uh, the implications for that interaction with asset losses remain unaffected. And then finally, looking at persistence, I see that uh, both the effects of uh, rate hikes and asset losses tend to persist for about one to two years after the initial shock. All right, um, 
So now with that, I'll wrap up. In this paper, I document that asset losses empirically increase the sensitivity of lending to conventional monetary policy. And uh, what this is uh, uh, telling us big picture is that the effect of monetary policy depends on the nature of financial frictions facing lenders. And in particular, it suggests that in the crisis episode, at least, the dominant frictions were ones that were alleviated by monetary easing. This is uh, 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 consistent with, um, I guess, uh, these friction, uh, monetary policy alleviating these frictions. Now, what do we learn about the mechanics of monetary policy? Uh, a couple things. First, this suggests that there's an extra benefit of easing. It can reduce the sensitivity of lending to asset losses. Basically, in a low rate environment, asset losses will not be as destructive. Additionally, lending is lumpy, so household outcomes might be uh, quite sharp and discreet uh, in terms of whether, you know, it's not just a question of a big loan, but whether or not someone's getting a loan in the first place. And finally, uh, monetary policy also uh, tilts the portfolio of lending that uh, lenders are engaging in. Uh, and in particular, what we see is substitution towards mortgages when easing occurs. Um, ultimately, uh, another big policy takeaway is that constraints on conventional policy, such as a zero lower bound or perhaps political constraints, these are extra costly in a financial crisis. And finally, these uh, empirical estimates imply that conventional and unconventional policies like large scale asset purchases are substitutes. So when we have um, uh, easing going on, the impact of changes on the asset side of the balance sheet are not going to be as powerful. So those large-scale asset purchases are not going to be as powerful when we're already dealing with the crisis with monetary easing. All right, uh, so I think we're just about at time, so I'll wrap up here. Thank you so much for all of your attention, and I'm looking forward to discussing your questions. Okay, so thanks a lot uh, for being so good on time as well, and a great presentation. So let me remind everybody, if you want to ask a question, uh, raise your hand and then I will uh, unmute you. So uh, while we ask, uh, while we wait for the audience, I think uh, we can kick it off maybe uh, with uh, Ralph as a question. Okay, yes, uh, great, uh, great presentation. Uh, just a quick question on unconventional policy. Okay, use these monetary policy shocks, but then they might be correlated. Uh, you know, also with a macro prudential policy that has been used, you know, more actively since, I guess, you know, 27 or so. So, you know, you talked about this a little bit in the end. Do you also try to estimate that empirically, looking at, you know, interest rate shocks versus macro prudential or asset purchase shocks? So I don't try to estimate them differentially. Uh, one way in which I've, I'm currently working on dealing with this a bit now is that FOMC announcements sometimes talk about these other tools. And uh, I have an RA right now who is going through parsing the data so that I can drop the days that have those other announcements. So my main concern has been not letting them kind of confound the interpretation. But I think something I hadn't thought about that you've got me thinking about now is I could also try and look at those days and see if there's something, I mean, I don't know if I'll have the power, but um, if I could see that, you know, there's a different response on those days, I could maybe learn something about the combination of the tools versus conventional policy on its own. Yeah, no, that's great. Exactly. It would be great to disentangle this. Yeah. Yeah, just uh, to the audience, uh, don't be shy. Raise your hand, ask questions if there's anything. Uh, I will wait for you. I, I also had a question. Yeah, so. I was wondering a little bit, uh, so in, in when you run the questions, you have a time fixed effect. So basically all other sort of macro shocks, they, are, they affect all the credit unions in a similar way. Um, but I wonder, <clears throat> yeah, I wonder, what, it could be the case. Uh, so the main, the, the main identification must come out of what, I, what happened around the financial crisis, but, um, but there could also be differential uh, response across uh, credit unions to, to other aggregate shocks, of course. Yes. So the main way in which I would say that the, the approach I'm using is trying to deal with the fact that there could be different sorts of like cyclical sensitivity or different sensitivities to other macroeconomic shocks is the high frequency identification. So I would be really worried about that if I didn't yeah. have this instrument for monetary policy. And I think I'm one and I think this might be worth mentioning because like a lot of people kind of use like a similar econometric approach. So I, I think a bit of a trick I'm using is I have quarterly data and then I have a year fixed effect. So I can kind of yeah. pull out the lower frequency macro stuff, but then I still have within year variation 
And uh, right. that still gives me a chance to estimate the that coefficient on something that varies at a quarterly frequency. Yeah. Although, I mean, there's one big change around then, but uh, yeah. Um, so we have a couple of questions from the audience too. Uh, first one is from Tobias Herbst. Uh, I'll allow you to talk. You need to unmute yourself. Yeah, hey, uh, great presentation. I really like the paper, but one thing that I was wondering is, what's the mechanism that you have in mind within the bank? So you're, you're basically regressing your outcome on macro variables, but then there must be something happening in the credit union or in the, I don't know, management process or between the different parts of the bank. So what do you think is happening there? Or how can you make sense of that? So uh, what I think is happening there could be something like uh, the second model that I mentioned very, very briefly. So uh, credit unions, uh, their cost of capital should affect uh, how much lending that they're doing. And monetary policy is gonna affect their cost of capital because it's changing the risk-free rate. And if they're paying a risk premium, which most lenders do because they have not only just depositors, but wholesale finance, which generally has a, a higher premium associated with it, asset losses can affect that premium and then also affect the cost of capital. So what I have in mind is basically we have two different shocks that are affecting the cost of capital. And you could also think of what I'm trying to do is essentially uh, get at the, what is the partial derivative of the cost of capital with respect to these two different shocks. So the cost of capital is gonna respond. It might respond more for some credit unions than others. And then that should then affect the lending decision. Okay, very good. We have another question from Zach Bethun. Uh, so let me allow you to talk. Uh, and you need to unmute yourself, Zach. Hey, Sasha, you can hear me. So. Very nice, thanks for the, thanks for the talk. Um, so I had a question that's similar to the question I was just asked on the liability side. You don't talk too much about the liability side. Are, are credit units, one, kind of very boring on the liability side? Are they raising cash through deposits? Or, and then if not, do you get any interesting interaction with these effects on the composition of their liabilities? So I don't have an empirical analysis I've done that I think could really speak to the liability side well here, I guess the closest thing I could think of that I've looked at is um, I did kind of like a nonlinear version of my main results where I bin my I estimate it within various subsamples and I look at high versus low net worth credit unions and I see something consistent with the main finding that I have already where it's the ones that are low net worth that are very responsive to monetary policy. So I think net worth kind of helps get at you know, get away from just looking at the asset side, but looking at the capital structure as a whole. But this is something that I um, I'm revising the paper right now, and I want to uh, dig into some of the channels on the liability side that could potentially matter here. So, for example, I want to look at this. Um, so, I think the interesting part of their funding is the wholesale finance margin, and I want to see how that is responding to try and validate how I'm interpreting the data right now. Yeah. Nice. Thanks. Okay, um, while we wait for the audience again, I had, um, I had another question. How, how do you interpret the result on the, so for the mortgages, um, all the action is on the extensive margin. Do you think about that sort of, um, that that's, um, that's just that uh, some people that go through this, through this episode and they're not really hurt by it. So, uh, or, uh, and, they, and they ask for similar size loans to what they would do. Otherwise, so or what's going on? So I so this is something that I've I've um wanted to potentially dig into deeper um because I think this has both uh, interesting implications and the why is also interesting. So what I think is happening uh, is that um, I am uh, doing a good job not allowing local economic conditions to confound uh, this causal effect I'm estimating. So what that means is that I'm pulling out things like house price decreases that could also be related to loan demand. So if I've kind of pulled that out and separated that already, then it shouldn't be that, you know, changes in house prices are affecting the, the mortgage size that people are wanting in equilibrium. And I think what this is telling us is that there might be a kind of lumpiness in how people make these housing decisions. And I think it's about frictions on the housing side of the market. So you kind of want a certain type of property. There's a certain time frame in which you want to get it. And you're going to apply and try and get your loans. And uh, it's not so much that the bank is going to play around with, do I want to 
give you a really big loan or this household is going to want to push for a really big loan, but it's about, am I, you know, how many loans am I willing to approve? I've, I thought it could also be um, that it might be that lenders kind of set a quality threshold and that quality threshold could change. So basically maybe if I'm in say better, worse condition, better cost of capital, I'm going to adjust that threshold and I'm going to now lend to like more lower FICO people. So I, my hunch is that there's something like that at play. And I think with perhaps loan level data, someone could explore that further. Wonder also whether the agencies, they may be important, at least in the part of the sample, because that they, after all, are making uh, interventions in the, in the mortgage market. You mean so like the, the purchase? The, like, the credit risk and for the, for the pass-through. Are you referring to the, 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 um, the purchases? Uh, yeah, the GSEs. Yeah, so the GSEs um, are making purchases in the market too, at least in some part of your sample. Yeah, so I'm hoping to. Um, uh, uh, this is related to what I'm, I mentioned. I'm doing um, uh, to, to Ralph's question. So uh, I want to drop FOMC days. So one thing I've done already is drop the days in which there was an unplanned meeting. But I also want to yeah. drop the ones where they talk about purchases. And then right. the idea is that that shouldn't be conflating things. So I think there's there's a risk that some of that is mixed in there right now. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, the, the, so the agencies, they definitely lean against the wind for monetary policy shocks. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's evidence of that. So th that should somehow show up, I guess. Yes. So that, I mean, that could be part of your interaction term, I guess. Right. Yeah, I think, but I guess like, so we, I think about, you know, the aggregate phenomena, the collapse of the ABS market, and then also any pol macro policy responses that were stabilizing that market as that's, a, as a, that's an aggregate phenomena. And then I have this Bartik style variation where I basically, you know, yeah. the aggregate thing could be endogenous, but your exposure is going to be exogenous. It's basically 20 years ago, you decided to pair with this corporate and they either got a lot of exposure or little exposure. Yeah. No, that's true. I see that, yeah. Yeah, in the, let me see if there are any questions uh, from the audience. There's one from uh, Ararat. Let me allow you to speak, Ararat. You need to unmute yourself. Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, my question is more speculative, not about the econometrics, but sort of about the interpretation of your results. To what extent do you think the margins you see the impact on um, are, might be particular to like credit unions as institutions and that for other kinds of institutions if it's lending or checking out, the margins might be different. And I would, I would immediately, I, would, I can't immediately think of any reasons why they particularly would be, but I'm just curious if you thought about those institutional details a bit more in terms of why it might look different for banks or other lending institutions. So I think one factor that can matter that, that could cause things to you know, make us want to be cautious in terms of external validity here is that uh, competition is very different for banks as opposed to credit unions. So credit unions, because of these common affiliations, they're kind of like little monopolists. And uh, uh, whereas banks, uh, there's, it seems like locally there's a bit of bank competition and that's something that has gotten a lot of attention in the finance literature. Now, um, Alex Zentifis has a paper, it's a theory paper that suggests that competition can interact with both the effects of asset losses and monetary policy. So I think that's the paper I would look at to kind of guide my thinking about how things might be different uh, for banks. But I think that would also be a really neat empirical uh, question to explore. And I'd be curious to see if the intensive extensive margin thing is also true uh, for for uh, commercial banks as well as credit unions. Thank you. Okay, one last question from uh, Jonathan Benjamin. I'll allow you to talk, uh, Jonathan. Yes. Hi, uh, Sasha. Very very interesting paper. D do you listen to me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so it's a very interesting paper. As I asked into the chat, so I will ask in live. So as far as I understood, constraints on conventional monetary policy are costly. So would you recommend negative interest rates policy to central banks? So this is the first question. And the second one is how would you evaluate cost benefits related to negative rates that say affect private bank balance sheets or increase too big to fail, uh, too big to fail risk, especially during a crisis? I think all in all, I am not sure conventional monetary policy is so costly compared to other costs during a crisis necessitating 
uh, quantitative easing, for instance? I think that's an excellent that's an excellent question. So I think my paper can't fully answer that, but I think it gives a useful building block for thinking about that kind of question. So I think the way that my paper can inform this debate about negative rates is that I'm pointing out one cost of the zero lower bound. Now, there's a lot of other costs, a lot of other benefits, and I think I would most be convinced by an answer that was coming from something more model based that where the model was informed by things like this empirical finding. So it's hard for, I can't take stock and say whether the costs outweigh the benefits, but this is pointing towards potentially an important cost of uh, the zero lower bound. Okay, great, fantastic. So uh, we'll wrap up here. Thanks to everybody for participating. Let me remind you, if you wanna participate in the post session, then there's the link in the chat. So you need to copy and paste from that. And uh, I will open it up in, uh, in one minute. Thanks a lot both to Lucas and Sasha for great presentations.